Welcome back to our discussion on Chapter 2 from our textbook, Rhetoric Online. This is Rebecca McCarthy for CMST 245 at South Seattle Community College. How's everybody doing? Let's see where we left off. Well, I think I left off talking a little bit about this idea that if we look at what is going on on new media, on the internet, and texts that we find there, that we can't analyze it or even approach it the same way we might approach a normal or traditional form of media, whether it's mass media um, or different forms of mass media, that is. And so our authors wants to talk about and give us an example of how this doesn't work. And so they look at Christine O'Donnell's witchcraft crisis. And I don't know if you guys remember that, but um, the authors does a very good job of reminding us what happened. She went on the Bill Maher show. Uh, well, Bill, first, Bill Maher showed a clip of, of Christine O'Donnell talking about how she dabbled in witchcraft, but she never joined a co coven. And um, then it went viral, the video, and I remember seeing it everywhere, actually. Twitter, Facebook, um, there was a lot of satire and parody done of it. And O'Donnell wanted to ignore it for the longest time because, you know, what a silly thing to have actually impede your... Um, your election process. But this uh, member of the Tea Party also happened to be a very spiritual woman, and part of her identity, part of her platform was built upon her spirituality. As a result, the fact that she once admitted that she dabbled in witchcraft actually became a problematic for her and her campaign. So she decided to have a rebuttal to that particular clip, and her rebuttal was, I'm you. And I'm reading on page 42, I'm not a witch. I'm nothing you've heard. I'm you. None of us are perfect, but none of us can be happy with what we see all around us. Politicians who think spending, trading favors, and backroom deals are the ways to stay in office. I'll go to Washington and I'll do what you'd do. I'm Christine O'Donnell, and I approve this message. I'm you. So this is her I'm you ad. And it was uh, posted as a formal TV commercial to respond to everything that was happening with the whole witch crisis. Unfortunately, the ad did not succeed because the ad approached us as an audience in the sense that we were a traditional audience. That means we would traditionally sit in front of our TV sets, receive the message, and then just take the message in, and then that would be the end of it, right? That's a traditional way in which people actually interacted with mass media. Again, mass media in some ways is a, the tr tr traditional mass media. It's a very linear process, right? And for a long time, people felt that we as audiences were just passive vessels sitting here, taking taking in all this information that we were being given by the news, by books, by music, and that we would just passively accept it. But the internet has changed that. It has made us active audiences. That means I have an opportunity to reply to anything that's presented to me. And that's exactly what happened. The ad failed because audiences reacted. They found the I'm you ad funny. And so lots of parodies came up and you can find many parodies today still uh, on the internet. Matter of fact, I will do a little searching for those parodies and upload it in our class so you can see it. But what's really important is this idea, this assumption that her reply, maybe even 10 years ago, would have worked very well. Because 10 years ago, there wasn't as much interactivity on the internet, and we didn't have as much of an active audience sphere going on. But in today's world, there was a totally different kind of formula going on, and so therefore O'Donnell's ad ended up failing. And in the end, it almost hurt her more than it ended up helping her. It's important to consider this idea of the active audience, and I know that our authors don't talk about it a little bit, and I will email you guys all an article I wrote a while back ago about Stephen Colbert and how he basically encourages his audience to be part of his show, to be an active element, to actually actively create content in which he produces and sometimes puts on his show. The idea of an active audience is important because we are no longer as an audience a passive vessel in which we're just receiving information that is being given to us by these so-called gatekeepers. Gatekeepers are the people who control information and presents it to us in this world. 
Rather, we are becoming an integral part of the mass media itself, the message itself. If we don't like the message, we even become active in changing the message or we parody the message. And so it's important when we look at the internet that we consider this idea of the active audience because we are no longer a stagnant kind of passive vessel receiving information. And this is important when we talk about the idea of the rhetorical construction of identity. Now, I want to go through the beginning part of this a little bit, and you can find this on page 43 and 44, because I think there are some terms and some ideas that might be a little bit difficult to understand, especially if you're not used to the jargon, if you will, of um, uh, rhetorical studies. One of the first things we come up against is this idea that we can somehow rhetorically construct our identity. And the term that's used is uh, rhetorically uh, constituted subjectivity. What does this mean? It's such a weird, weird, weird word. I mean, not word, phrase in general. So I want to approach this from this point of view. Does the act of speaking or writing or creating a rhetorical text, that is a text that is used to somehow persuade or create identity between me and a potential audience, does that act of creating create my reality or does my reality impose upon me what I'm going to say? Kenneth Burke, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and I introduced him earlier with this idea of identification and rhetoric. Kenneth Burke has this kind of wonderful theory. He, he kind of takes it from theater. But the idea is that you have the act, you have the scene, you have the players, you have different elements that you would probably find in a play production, right? And the question is this. Does the scene compel us to speak or are we speaking to create our scene. I'm hoping this makes sense to you. For example, does presidential speech happen because a person is standing in the Oval Office space? Or does the Oval Office become created as a, prudential, uh, a presidential space because of the speech we utter, right? So it, it's kind of a philosophical question. Are we creating our reality or is our reality creating us, right? When we speak, though, if you go back to, you know, that whole wonderful phrase, you know, I think, therefore I am, right? That's kind of what we're suggesting here is that we are rhetorically creating, if you will, our identity by our speech acts, okay? Whether those speech, speech acts are a formal speech, a writing in a diary, whether we're creating a video, it doesn't matter. A speech act itself can take on many different forms. And let's look on page 44. So if rhetorically creating our identity happens through our different kinds of speech acts, speech acts what happens on the internet? Now, the internet, once again, is kind of fragmented and it's also varied in content. We have things called hypertextual content. And what does this mean? Well, if you are reading a news article, you'll often find um, internet uh, links that are embedded in that news article, right, that takes you to other pieces of information. So that news article itself, that one piece of text, becomes something larger than life because as you click on the different URLs that are embedded and you're taken to either advertisements or additional pieces of information or videos, right? You are being given a more complex understanding of the identity of that particular text, okay? So a hypertextual landscape then actually gives us a very complicated kind of text to analyze. And the more complicated the text, the more then our identity is more rooted in that complicatedness, that hypertextualness of the text. And I'm hoping this actually helps you a little bit with understanding what they're talking about. In some ways, we're really just discussing this idea that when we're going online and we're creating this content, we are trying to create a certain type of image. We are branding ourselves, right? So if, in a sense, I am branding myself with you guys right now by creating this podcast that I'm going to now upload to YouTube and you'll be able to listen to. 
the more information I put in this and the more I present myself uh, in relation to the information I'm presenting to you, the more I'm creating a particular identity for my audience. Now, with these podcasts, if I had included things like pop-up bubbles or if we have a conversation underneath the podcast where people are making comments about the content, then the identity actually becomes even more complex as well. Not only does the identity become more complex, but it's also important to realize that I lose control of this identity. All of a sudden, the identity or the branding, if you will, of this particular podcast then is also determined by the comments that are left from other users and any kind of replies that come in. The more we have this interaction going on, then the more the identity of that person particular piece of text then changes and it becomes dependent not only upon me who is the creator the original creator of the content but then it becomes dependent upon everybody else who participated in that content as well she gives uh, our authors give a good example of this with the Tea Party Nation and their social networking site, and that's on page 45. So go ahead and explore that. I'm going to give you just one more podcast this week, so we're going to talk a little bit about determinism versus relativism, and then that'll be it. I'll see you on the boards. Goodbye.